I say, what ho, this is Brian. Call me Mello, the man who knows what he's been missing, Gardner, coming to you from Ramblon Towers Galley Studio in scenic Hesper, Ontario. And you are listening to Ramblon Radio, episode 78. Ramblon Radio is the only de- dedicated Led Zeppelin podcast on this or any other known internets. Be sure to go to ramblonradio.com for all your Led Zeppelin news, reviews, any links I might mention during the show, etc. You can subscribe to Ramblon Radio through iTunes. If you go to iTunes, leave a review. If you happen to be an iTunes, buying anything, right? You, you, uh, pop over, leave a little review. Um, you know, your favorite version of I'll Be Home for Christmas or whatever. Just pop over to the podcast and leave a quick review. Uh, it just helps them to notice us, gets place, gets better placement for us. Uh, you can subscribe to Ramblon, okay, iTunes, and listen on Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, and uh, be sure to follow Ramblon Radio on Spreaker. And if, we can get, if I can get it up to 100 followers, then, then you can subscribe to iHeartRadio, which puts it in front of thousands of people. We can turn this into, um, well, a money machine. <laughs> Make rich all of a sudden, because everybody's making rich on, uh, on, on on the internet these days. And checking out at Ramble On Radio on YouTube. Uh, follow Ramble On Radio on Facebook, Google Plus, and at Ramble On Blog on Twitter. I do try to respond to people. Sometimes I wait until the show. Sometimes somebody says something on Facebook, and I go, you know what? I'm going to respond to that on the show because I have to have something to say. I have to. Say. My wife says, "What do you say?" Because asking me that question is easier than actually listening to the show, by the way. That's that's the short answer there. Um, the long answer is, I don't know what I say. And, but I'm always looking for something. So, you know, yeah, if you say something on there, if I don't reply right on Facebook, there might be a chance that that I'm, I'm just holding off. And I thought, you know what, this is, it'd be easier to say than to write um, what, what I feel like on this one. And so that happens. Otherwise, I do try to I do try to communicate with people on these forums. I do try to to respond or, or let you know that I've seen it in some way. Um, like the shirt, if you're on YouTube, the shirt it's got all the song names from the it's like backwards. All the song names uh, starts at good times, bad times, and goes all the way to actually a few things that don't even make. But it's by album, by album side, good times, bad times. Whatever. If I pull out the albums, I can tell you what the shirt says. I might be able to read it there. Mm, babe, I'm going to leave you. You shook me, see? Days that confuse. Your time is going to come. Black Mountainside. Uh, communication breakdown. I can't quit you, babe. Etc. So it's it goes from the first one to the last one, to stuff that popped up on the, uh, I think, the 92 sets and whatnot. Um, I'm not even sure what two of these songs are. Uh, and so I have, to, I have to dig into that, actually. Uh, I forget where they turned up. The last two, the, I know they turned up in the, but I'm not sure where they actually are, uh, what they, where they come from. Anyway, courtesy of uh, a guy, guy called James, James Foodie. Uh, James, a big get. The, I know James through Get the Let Out. He's a big Get the Let Out guy. Uh, been to like 150 shows. And uh, he, uh, James is, um, he, he put together. This, he saw the pattern, liked it, thought, you know, I'll make a shirt. He put it together, and he's basically made it for some of his friends. Uh, to get the let up guys and that sort of thing. And I mentioned, I, I said, oh, I need a shirt. And he graciously not only got it made up for me, sent it to me. Um, and there used to be a commercial for, uh, we're going back to the 70s for Mr. Transmission, I think, or Speedy Transmission or one of those guys. And the guy, little Italian guy, goes to the thing. It was a loose, it was just a loose bolt. He says, no, charge. That was James. No, charge. If you live in Ontario at that time, and I go, no, charge, you know exactly what I'm talking about, by the way. It's one of those commercials. Anyway, this, that was James. Not Chatterjee. He says, you have to send me a picture. So I've actually taken a picture of me recording this episode to put on the Facebook page to show James. Uh, I'm hoping it doesn't break the internet, but too many. This, doing this, doing that, doing that. Picture of this, that. I don't know. Taking a picture of me taking a video. Of, you know. Ugh. But anyway, thanks to James for the shirt. It's a beauty. It fits. Um, and I... You know, don't go hunting him down and, and asking for one because I'm not so sure he's cool with that. <laughs> I don't think he minds terribly. I mean, you know, but... Um, he, and he's actually come up with a few other designs uh, he's showing on Facebook the last couple of days. So, so that's kind of cool. Um, and speaking of James, I know James, you're going to see Get the Light Out. James has been to see them like a hundred and something times. Um, 
I've seen, he's, I've been, I've seen him in New York City. I've seen him, you know, um, and I've seen him in Milwaukee. And he was at both of those shows. Dig that. And he's from the New York area. Uh, he heads out to Philadelphia on the first Sundays for the Bridgeport Rib House. The guys get to let out to a jam night. He heads out to that sometimes. He gets all over. But he won't go to Buffalo. I said to him, how about Buffalo? I won't do Buffalo. He's <laughs> gorgeous. Poor Buffalo. Poor Buffalo. But I did do Buffalo. I did. Even though people were telling me it was crazy. They got four feet of snow. You'll never get there. It's an hour and a half away. And we had no problems. We had no problems. Now, if you're going kind of south of the city, around the lake, um, around Lake Erie, you know, Buffalo to Cleveland, Buffalo in Pennsylvania, and Erie, Pennsylvania, that sort of thing. Um, it's apparently that's where it gets really bad. And then, then south around um, in, the, in the west, south in the west is where it gets really bad. Um, in Buffalo downtown, and then we went shopping kind of fairly close to there, and then over to Niagara Falls, New York, for some shopping too. But that was all fun. So if you're heading into Buffalo for a show or something, or for some, I know some people going and quite panicky about going this week for uh, um, Black Friday shopping, but the shopping areas in, in downtown Buffalo is fine. It's, it's kind of on the outskirts of Buffalo that it's bad. And the guys in the band coming from the east saw none of the big snow either. So it's not as bad as they're making out um, for the most part, I guess is what, is what to say. Um, um, but yeah, so we had a good time at Buffalo. And uh, I meant to pull out my thing. Oh, I meant to pull out my, uh, I wonder if I have it here. Um, uh, I've seen these guys six times now. I, I, so I went and seen God the Light Out and I uh, had a wonderful time. The guys treated me like gold. Um, nice conversation. I went in this time thinking, I kind of tend to mumble stuff to Paul about guitars or something and, and um, Kind of decided this time I'm, I'm going to not talk to him about work or if I'm going to talk to him about guitars I'm going to have something you know to say unless he brings it up you know I'm not going to say no Paul I've decided I'm not having that conversation with you today if he wants to talk about it and so happens I was working on my own guitar um and uh doing the, doing a fairly big job on my last Paul refretting it putting on it what they call a compensated nut and um doing it myself so that gave us something to actually talk about um, on that front, I talked to him and Jimmy a little bit about that work, but we talked all sorts of, we ended, I ended up in the backstage with Paul Sinclair and him talking, um, talking about their, they played CBGB's in New York City, the famous punk bar, and, uh, they've been playing together for, you know, 30, 40 years, um, from those early days, the two guys, so we kind of got into a little bit of memory lane and stuff they were doing before, get the let out, but together, um, which was cool, that's, it's, they liked talking about it, and it's, it's great to hear that sort of thing. Um, it's good to get people out of their normal, because they get the let-out show, everybody wants to talk about Dublin with them, you know? Um, so we, we minimized that conversation. We had a nice chat, chat with um, the drummer, Adam, for the first time, too. Adam Ferrola, I believe his name is, and uh, lovely, very quiet-spoken guy. How, how do you get to be the John Bonham guy, and you're so quiet? Um, but he is, and he's uh, a lovely man. And uh, we had a good, good conversation, a good chat about drums and uh, what um, the usage, the, the minimum usage his kettle drum gets, I think. And uh, but uh, anyway, anyway. So what I wanted to say about them though is this: this is, I mean, this is one of the things to love about them. You, you go to a show and you know, you know, it's going to be Led Zeppelin tribute band. So you're going to hear rock and roll. You're going to hear Black Dog. You're going to hear a whole lot of love. You're going to hear Stuart Head. You're going to hear Cashmere. Um, you're going to hear. Honey, is there any other must hears in there? Um, here's the thing, they didn't play Rock and Roll at Black Dog. Here's, here's their set list, and uh, um, this is key. I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen them six times, right? So here's the first five songs. Good Times, Bad Times, How Many More Times, Houses of the Holy, The Ocean, and Ten Years Gone. I have seen them do The Ocean previous. That's it. I had never seen any of the other four songs. Six times I've seen these guys. Good Times, Bad Times, How Many More Times, Houses of the Holy, and Ten Years Gone. I've never seen those. Dynamite songs, all four, uh, and they nailed them. The ocean, great. Then it goes, babe, I'm going to leave you. Ramble on, days to confuse. The acoustic set, going to California, Battle of Evermore. Hey, hey, what can I do? Um, and then, then intermission. After intermission, here's another one. I never heard them play before. Achilles' Last Stand. Can you, can you just imagine going to a bar, going to a club, 
and some bands playing Achilles last day. And then, then they're not some band. I get that. But, but geez, and they nailed it. They nailed it. Um, although Paul assured me he had a, a flub at the intro, intro of the solo. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But um, I didn't pick it up. And uh, I, I thought he actually does. I was sitting going, oh, Jesus, he's getting that solo just so. Because it's it's one of the better page solos, I think. Matter of fact, I like I consider in terms of pure rocking it out, good times, bad times is one of the great page solos. Achilles Last Stand is one of the astounding solos he does. And Fool in the Rain, and they did Fool in the Rain later as well. So it goes Achilles Last Seconds at Achilles Last Stand, Thank You, Moby Dick, Fool in the Rain, Hot Song for Nowhere, and Cashmere. Um, uh, Encore, Misty Mountain Hop, Stairway to Heaven, Whole Lot of Love. So every time I've seen them, they've done Whole Lot of Love, Stairway to Heaven, Cashmere, and, and Dazed and Confused. I think they throw Ramble on in most times too. Um, but to hear them do something like Achilles Last Dam was just, and like I say, Fool in the Rain, and Paul does all three of the souls Good Times, Bad Times, Achilles Last Dam, Fool in the Rain, and nailed all three of them. And they were, it was just an astounding, really good night. Um, and I want to thank the guys for uh, having me down, um, setting me up with tickets, entertaining me, <laughs> as it were, after the show. We had, I had a lovely day, and. Uh, and it was great to see them all. Uh, a good bunch of guys. You know, not just great musicians, not just a great band, not just great musicians, but but actually a good bunch of guys. Um, so, so anyway, if you get a chance to see Get the Let Out, um, and how's this for a Facebook topic? Um, who is your favorite? Because I don't get to see them all. And there's guys out west, and there's guys down south, and there's guys up here in Canada, and there's one in Canada called Coda, who I've stumbled around my town a bit, and I've never managed to see. I I follow them on Facebook and I pick up after her. This is us in Kitchener last weekend. And you go, well, if you had put in the Facebook page last weekend that you were playing in Kitchener this week, I might have gone. But anyway, that's, you know, um, they, uh, there's lots of them and there's some very good ones. Um, and Get the Let Out is the very best of them. Uh, and don't believe me, they played the Red Rocks Amphitheater this summer. Um, Yes, the same Red Rocks Amphitheater that you two played, for instance. Uh, and and it's actually been recorded, and it's going to be on PBS sometime next year. And they're also going to release a CD of the show, um, is what I'm told. Lots of rights issues with that sort of CD, but nothing that should be insurmountable, as long as you appropriately credit the music. So... Uh, yeah, God bless. Uh, they're a good bunch of guys, and they're great musicians. And I'd love to hear which ones you like. It's the bands to keep an eye open for, you know? Um, where am I at? Where am I at? Okay, okay. So the intro, the the intro for you guys on on YouTube or on not on I'm on, not on YouTube, actually, um, is and I have not edited it down yet, so I don't know exactly what he says. <laughs> but it's Jimmy Page on Ellen. Uh, he was on Ellen earlier this last week. He, he did it when he was in L.A. two weeks ago, but and I think I mentioned it last week, but it hadn't aired yet. It aired, I think, last Friday. Um, oh, speaking of being Friday, happy Thanksgiving. This is Thanksgiving Day down in the States to you guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, I hope, hope you have a good one, good feast, and uh, um, good football, and, and put on some Zeppelin to finish off the night. It should be a good night. Uh, but anyway, happy Thanksgiving down there, guys. Um, so, yeah, pages on Ellen. Showed last Friday, I think, and he, um, it was a fairly, it was, here's the thing, it was an okay interview. Uh, it was not a disaster as I, I thought it could have been. Um, and Paige has gotten fairly good at the just kind of the sports type interview. You know, it was, we gave 110% out there, <laughs> you know. Um, he doesn't, he hasn't said that yet, but he, that that's coming in his repertoire, I think. Uh, but he doesn't say anything new. He doesn't say anything interesting or new anymore. He's pretty much said it all by now and and one of the i guess one of the problems is the age we live in is, you know in the 70s you saw one interview or two interviews a year with jimmy page and you really had no opportunity to see it, if that right but you really had no opportunity he did interviews but you never saw them so if one came across your desk um it was oh, it was all new and it was exciting and it was interesting and you had no real way of knowing what he said in other interviews and you had no real way of knowing getting access to those interviews unless you want to go to the library and start hunting them down and, um, you know so so as a kid growing up in the 70s he, he, these things are so uncommon nowadays of course every interview is on the internet almost immediately after it broadcasts or airs or is printed it's on the internet you're in the news groups talking about it 
And, and so when he says the same thing, interview, interview, in, interview in, interview out, it becomes very boring very fast. So he's really not saying anything new. And he probably didn't say anything new in the 70s, on a, in this interview to that interview. Um, but who knew who cared, right? Um, nowadays, it's uh, every interview is the same, same old boring stuff. So he's really kind of a boring interview that I find these days. Um, an interesting guy, and he's a good speaker and well-spoken and stuff. But he doesn't say anything new. And he didn't on Ellen, and he hasn't in any of the interviews I've seen since. You know, even when I saw him in New York, he, I, was, I was excited to be there, and I loved it, and it was great sitting kind of listening to him in that setting and hearing him speak from, you know, for an hour. No distractions, uh, which tends to be the problem. You, know, you put it on the Internet, and then I cook dinner or something, and I miss half the interview anyway. Um, and I'll get to one of those in a second. Um you know, so it, it's interesting enough, and he's got to do what he's got to do, but it's, it's also, he's, he didn't say anything. He hasn't said anything in the ages that I didn't hear six months ago. Um, and that's not his fault. That's the nature of the beast. Um, and, and I guess probably pros would tell you, yes, repeat, <laughs> repeat as necessary. You know, hammer hammer your message home. You have a, He's selling something. He's got a message to sell. Hammer it home. Um, so he's... But yeah, I, I mean, so these interviews come up and interview after interview after interview. And I, I kind of go, I don't, you know, I don't often, time's valuable enough that I, I kind of don't. Um, and Robert Plant, and, and this is what I was talking about, he did an interview in Chicago. I, I forget what it was, who it was for. A couple of guys, it was in a studio and a couple of guys sat behind their microphones and he sat behind his microphone. And they talked for, it was an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, no, I don't think it was quite that long, but... I got about 25 minutes to it before I ran out of time. And, and again, I was cooking dinner. I was make, making stuff happen as I was doing it. But I find with Plan, he's almost the opposite. He says all sorts of stuff, but really says nothing. You, you know what he reminds me of? Um, he reminds me of me when I've been drinking and somebody wants to let me let me go. <laughs> I got to talk, you know. You know, and he, they ask him, and I think interviewers have picked it up. They ask him some, they'll ask him some random kind of questions, some very open-ended questions. They ask Robert Plant very open-ended questions. You'll get five-minute answers in which he talks about whales and Texas and women he's loved before and the music of John Hurd and the music of, of some guy you've never heard of in Africa and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and he'll just go on and rhapsodizing and philosophizing and at the end of it, he hasn't said anything. There's no kind of meat on the bones for, for a guy like me who's got a show to do. Let's put it that way. If, you know, if you're looking at it from a journalistic perspective, there's no meat on, his, on the bones of what he says every once in a while. And I think it gets him in trouble. I think that's, you know, when he says stuff that we get angry about here, we say, I think that's what's happening. He's just kind of going, uh, and somebody's, you know, the only thing he said in the interview that was interesting was, <laughs> you know, Something about Led Zeppelin being a boy band or something about, you know, something that annoys the fan base. Uh, and he really doesn't necessarily even mean it, doesn't even realize what he said, I suspect. Um, but that's, you know, the, kind of the two different perspectives on their interviews, and neither of them, at the end of the day, are very interesting interviews anymore, I find, because neither of them are saying anything that's that's new or interesting to me. Um not that they're and and I, I don't mean that to say they're not interesting or that that I'm not interested in what they have to say or that you know I just find that it's um, I'll, I'll put on an interview for 10 minutes and I'm gonna uh, you know nothing's happening here no he's and he may at the 40 minute mark make some interesting comment about something but um, that's you know so that's there but there's lots of interviews out there these days with, with Robert touring and, and Jimmy just finished up his wrapping up his uh his 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 um, book signings and whatnot, and here's another book signing in London. So that means more interviews to come. Uh, all right, a um, uh, couple of issues, a couple of things. Sorry, uh, I missed this one. Unleaded was released November eight, uh, nineteen ninety four. So uh, for twenty years ago, uh, about I'm gonna go back here, uh, two two and a half weeks. Um, Man, it's the 27th, so 19 days. That's easy math. Um, 
uh, I talk a fair bit going back to, uh, I started keeping track of what I said on certain episodes. So you have to, uh, just give me a minute here while I go um, backwards through, <laughs> how's that, eh? Um, but I, I did, yeah, on, on August, um, the last one I did on episode 70 in August, I talked about it was 20 years since they re recorded Unleaded. Uh, and I talked in a fair detail about that at the time. I'm not convinced I have anything more to say. Um, I, I had intended to do a show specifically on it, but after that show was wrapped, I kind of, I don't know that I have anything to say that it wouldn't be repetitive. Um, I don't think I've learned anything new about it in the last, you know, um, there is the Robert Plant book that we talked about a few weeks back. Um, uh, Dave Thompson's book mentions that that Plant uh, kind of threw a challenge in front of Plant. He had some rhythms that he'd been sampling, and, and the plan was to make a, a backbeat of these rhythms, these uh, African rhythms. And, uh, and so, but I've just finished, uh, I'm going to talk about it in a bit, Glenn John's book, and he went... He went to the concert in the desert in the '60s with Brian Jones, and he went um, he went off to Brian Jones uh, into North Africa and got a bunch of rhythms. and And Brian Jones had talked about doing it, and it sounds like a very similar thing to what Plant was doing in the in the '90s. And, and so when he met up with Page, he uh, he gave him one. It was a challenge. Here here's one. You want to do this? Okay, I want to see that you're serious. Here's these rhythms I've got. Here's one specific. Go do something with it. Bring it back. We'll talk after that. So Paige did, uh, and he kind of thought that that it wasn't going to happen. He, the the it's it's phrased in the book as such that he wondered if Paige wanted to make music or drive ride in the limo with David Coverdale. That was his. Uh... And Paige came back with uh, with it done, and and what he came back with um, impressed Robert. It turned out to be Yalla. Uh, on the album. I don't know if we've talked about that a bit before. So, um, so yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I got nothing much more to say about Unleaded, though. That's, it's just, in, in, it's a, it's a lovely, it's a great album. I, I really like it. Um, it nails, you know, it kind of changes up, but doesn't completely alter a number of performances of Led Zeppelin songs. Um, and they do a few that are straight up, you know, Black Dog is still Black Dog, um, that sort of thing. You know, but what they change, they, they maintain the integrity of the song, I think, uh, is, is the point. And I like that, uh, while still changing things up. Um, um, oh, yeah, uh, that's now in, in November 21st, so going back a week, uh, 1995, so we're going to... Uh, 19 years ago, uh, since the death of Peter Grant. Uh, suddenly, he had actually spent much of the 80s and into the early 90s in, uh, in seclusion, kind of drug-fueled, uh, cleaned up, lost a pile of weight um, going into the 90s, was, and was a proper British gentleman, you know, and he was, uh, he was actually chauffeuring people. He was doing, he picked up Occasionally, some friend at a chauffeur business or something like that. Uh, I forget how it goes. Um, <laughs> and uh, was was doing that. Was chauffeuring people on you know weddings and stuff on weekends. People didn't know that Led Zeppelin's manager was taking them to their wedding because um, he'd lost so much weight. One, I mean, it was just something for him to do to get him out of the house. And not, uh, and I don't think he needed the money. Um, but he died very suddenly of a heart attack in 1995. Uh, my favorite Peter Grant story comes from his daughter. Um, there's a book on Peter Grant, and I meant to get it, and I, I, I think I've made a mental note to myself. This time next year, I will read it. Um, it's, it's one I've looked at a number of times and almost pressed the, pressed the buy button. I think I will um, next year, so I, have, I can talk about it maybe on his, uh, the 20th anniversary of his, of his death. But my favorite Peter Grant story comes from his daughter. Uh, talks about he used to show up at school in the old, he had an old sports car, well, we know the old sports car from the song Amazing the Same. He used to show up in that with goggles, a, a, an old 1920s style goggles and the, the riding helmet and the gloves, the uh, driving gloves to pick up his daughter from school. And she'd say, why can't you just be like the other dads? 
<laughs> and you can see it would be it would be yeah it would be really embarrassing wouldn't it uh, if you're a teenager get moving into your teenage years and your dad's this out there kind of character like that um but anyway that's a, that's and and of course there's a lots of peter grant stories and lots of them are not uh, lovely story nice stories like that um but i you know i that's that's kind of my favorite it, it talks a little bit about that he really was a character um uh, and and um finally and finally in terms of um before we get to get to the heart of the get to the business uh, James Dillon, the singer from uh, Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin Experience, has a um, he is doing a um, last year last year at Christmas we talked he did a Robert Plant he's a he's an artist and so he drew a picture of Robert Plant uh, it's the one with him uh, holding a dove at uh, Kazaa Stadium in, in San Francisco and uh, it's lifelike it's it's scary good. Uh, and now he's done one of John Bonham. It was supposed to be wrapped up this. I think by now he wanted all four done. He wants to do all four guys. I think by now he wanted it done. Um, but it's not happened as fast as he'd like, I know. Uh, but he did get it done. And it's available now, right now, jamesdillonofficial.com. Uh, $95 for a 9 by 13 print signed by James himself. $65 by, for a 6 and a half by 10 print signed by James uh, Dillon himself, and uh, um, last time there was two thousand dollars you could get the original of Robert Plant. I haven't heard that he's making that available, um, but if you're really interested in spending that kind of money on an original James Dillon picture, it might be worth getting a hold of him on Facebook and uh, asking. Uh, if it's available, but uh, those prints are available. They will make a lovely Christmas present for a Led Zeppelin fan, uh, particularly if they're John, uh, John Bonham fans in your list. It looks like he still has Robert Plant pictures available too. Um, again, and we we'll make a lovely Christmas. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll do the Christmas uh, Christmas present episode, the gift giving episode, the honey, if you really love me, this is what you'll do episode. Um, but for now, uh, just be settled if there's, there's an idea. Um, I read uh, read this week Glenn John's book uh, Sound Man Glenn John's um, at age of 17 got a job um, by stroke of sheer luck um, got a job at BMI Studios I think it was in London um, and it was they were the, the most prominent independent studio so not BBC not government run um, and and they were they were used they were basically hired out in six hour slots for session people and he got a job being the Johnny everything um, mop the floors and set up the mics and uh, carry all the gear when they did live shots for instance uh, the orchestras wouldn't come into the studio the studio would go to the orchestras and uh, you know so they would spend time and time and time and he tells the story that they would set up they have a production room somewhere. And they would set up all the mics, and they would run them to the board. They would everything would be set up, um, and it would be, all be done without the actual engineer in the room. He would show up when it was time to show up, and he would show up, turn up the volume full, and they would have a, a couple of monitor speakers there, and he'd stick his head between the monitor speakers, and if he could hear any humming, somebody was in trouble. <laughs> but that was his job: make sure it wasn't humming, make sure everything, all the chords were run, and all the mics were working. And, and whatnot. And he eventually grew to, uh, fairly quickly really, um, actually engineering. And especially when the rock guys came in. A lot of these old guys didn't like the music, didn't want anything to do with it. So the rock guys start coming in and he gets the job. He accidental into his first job. Um, bottom line is the engineer was supposed to record. It was a weekend job. The engineer was supposed to record it, didn't show. Um, and they basically say, well, you do it. You got it. And, uh, it went. It actually became a hit. It went well. Well, it sort of went well. It was, the story goes that the producer was not happy that he got some guy who'd never engineered before, and complained and bitched to the studios. The record company basically called and complained and bitched and didn't want to have to pay for the studio time, etc., etc. And uh, uh, 
when he was called into the office, he said, I did what I could, listen to the recording. And they listened to the recording, said, you know what, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's perfect. And they called the record company back, says, uh, stuff your complaint. There's nothing wrong. Listen to the recording. Don't listen to the guy who was, who was saying it all went wrong. And uh, from there on in, he got jobs. <laughs> that's what it was. So he became an engineer, and he started, you know, the stones. He started getting into the stones. He was living for a while with uh, Ian McLaughlin. No, Stuart, uh, Stu, uh, Stone's keyboard player, Stone's keyboard player, Ian Stewart, uh, who Led Zeppelin boogied with, of course. Um, and so the Stones, when the Stones first got out, used to like hang out at their house. Um, the girls would, you know, the, you hear the story of the girls chasing them up the street, it would be his house they would run into. Um, so he was with the Stones from the very early days, right through to um, Black and Blue, I think, 73 or 75. Um, did some of the early Who signals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Knew Jimmy Page as a young man. Uh, him and Page grew up not that far from each other, and he met him at a uh, like a, a variety show at a youth club uh, where Page was playing, and he recognized then that boy, this guy, this kid's pretty good. Um, and they were both kids, you know, they would have been twelve or something at the time. Um, John's actually was a singer and uh, sang in the choir, and he. he cites that as being life-changing moment and uh, joining this church choir because he, he learned to sing he got very into music and everything follows from that one um so he did he and he engineered led zeppelin one their first album his brother andy who he got into the business uh worked on on three or four of their other albums i think on three four and houses of the holy maybe into physical graffiti and Eddie johns was there um, but Glenn Johns did the first album, and he takes very little credit. He basically says, I, I just sat back and stayed out of the way, you know, pushed the buttons and stayed out of the way because these guys knew what they wanted, and Paige and Jones were studio veterans. Um, but he does... Um... Well, I haven't even got to the topic yet. <laughs> 30 minutes. I thought this was going to be a fast one. Amazing, isn't it? Um, you know, I'm going to have to wrap up very shortly, actually. So, uh, um, so, uh, so, where was I? Oh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Train of thought just derailed before the station. How do you like that, eh? Um, so, yeah, so he, he didn't have much, but he does talk about developing what he calls the stereo drum technique, and he developed it on those Led Double One sessions with John Bonham. It basically amounts to, uh, you know, you plan to put four mics, um, and you run them into one channel. And what he did, what he accidentally discovered with uh, the Zeppelin sessions was he could um, he could have a, one of the mics kind of points towards the, the snare. Um, he, could, he could run that. He, he cha had to change the mic setup just a little bit, but he could run that into a separate channel, separate the channels. And then when you bring them back together uh, in the mixing, you, you, you bring them not all the way back together. And what would happen is that one mic would pick up the ambience of the rest of the drum set. So you really got a stereo effect in the drums uh, with the entire drum set. Um, and uh, uh, so he talks a bit about that. Uh, but other than that, his bid on Led Zeppelin's maybe five pages long um, on the first album. He talks every once in a while, he runs into Jimmy Page or something, but not very often. He was involved with the Arms Tour. He did the recordings and whatnot for the Arms Tour. So he saw it, but he doesn't really mention Page in that. Um, uh, but, uh, um, so it's not, that's, it's, it's, it's interest from a Led Zeppelin perspective, there's some interest, but it's not something you would go out and say, well, he talks about Led Zeppelin, so I'm going to spend my $25 on this book. It's not a Led Zeppelin book. However, if you are a music fan, uh, and specifically a 70s music fan, 60s, 70s, those bands, The Who, The Stones, Zed, Zeppelin, um, and it kind of, it's a list that's scary. Uh, it goes on at the band. Um, this was a really good book. This was a really enjoyable book. Um, you, you know, if you listen to this podcast often enough, you know my bitch. I hate books where um, where people talk forever. And I, and I, I always cite the, uh, you know, uh, the, the going with Grandpa Gus across the river to get fish and chips stories uh, from... <laughs> From, from poor uh, Keith Richards' book, 
But um, that's the fact. Uh, there's too many books waste too much time talking about crap that has nothing to do. I'm here because I want to know about the music, you know, about the musician and the music and to a degree the man. Uh, but I don't really want to know about your potty training or about, uh, and you think I'm kidding. Go read Stompin' Tom Connors' autobiography. Go get past the first two chapters if you can. He uh, he has a memory of, he, from his, the earliest, earliest days, and he talks about potty training. He talks about his potty training. Um, if you're looking for a book that you'll never finish, there's one. Um, so yeah, I, I have no time for that stuff. He does not, there's not a single story in this book that is irrelevant to the point that he is a musician or he's, he's an engineer, he's a music guy. So even going back into his youth, he talked, he starts it with joining the choir, um, which is relevant, right? And, and it's interesting from a musical perspective. And then he talks about on summers, he would, they would tootle off to the farm, his uncle's farm. And, and you're thinking, oh, here we go, all right, here's the Uncle Gus stories, but no, no, no. Um, the relevant point was his uncle was a guitar player who loved the American folk music and used to sit at night singing to them. So it's three or four pages of, of the farm. And it, this point of the story was he got introduced at a very young age to this music that most kids in, in England at the time weren't hearing. Um, and so on and so forth. There's no, there's, I, I couldn't think of one example of a story that was not relevant musically. Um, so that was I, so for that I really enjoy it, and he gets into the meat of the story fairly quickly. Uh, it's interesting to talk about being in the studio even before he's doing anything other than writing. My, is interesting. Um, there's perspective there of what it's like to do that kind of work, and then of course he gets down to the work, and uh, um, and they're just yeah the names the names the names the names. There's so many people that he's worked with, um, ideas that he came up with. Um, stuff you've never heard of country people, rock people and, and he has real neat opinions on new music and what's going on in recording and he does, it's not music so much it's recording techniques and he has no time for it he likes the band in the studio together um, and, he, and he thinks actually music's been ruined uh, by studio technology not by the musicians, not by the record but by studio technology and the use thereof um, has ruined modern music He's really, and he really kind of dropped out of the music business and get to about the mid 80s and his discography just just about disappears there's an album here and an album there um, and it, it's voluntary he just says how I do it is no longer relevant and I don't want to be relevant in the kind of environment that uh, um, is, is being done nowadays now he's, he also indicates at the end that that's changing a bit and then he, he's He's under the opinion that he's, he's, again, kind of relevant, and he's been doing some work, but, yeah, there's a long hiatus, and uh, uh, it's a really interesting, it's a good book, and it's a really interesting book. Um, so that's Glenn Johns, uh, Sound Man, I believe it's called, Sound Man by Glenn Johns, G-L-Y-N, by the way, if you're looking. Um, has, has relevant Led Zeppelin content, but not enough... Not anywhere near enough to go out and buy a book on. Uh, if you're thinking, oh, I just buy Led Zeppelin books, don't bother. It's, you know, you're, you're talking four story, four Jimmy Page stories and five pages on the first album. And that's about it. So, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, but, but if you just want a book, a music book, um, it's exceptional. Um, and I would, yeah, I would recommend it highly. And again, another Christmas list book. Um, speaking of the Christmas list, I was going to also review this tonight. Tight But Loose, number 38. And I think I showed it last week. He does an interview with Jimmy. It's a 50,000 worder. And he does a number of really, but I'm not going to get into it because I, I actually got to wrap up and, and uh, get ready to go to work. So there's, um, there you go. Tight But Loose, number 38. Look, you're looking for a Christmas gift for somebody? Go to tblweb.com, go to Type But Loose, Google Type But Loose, it'll come up. It's, uh, I think it's tblweb.com. Yeah, nice putting it on there, yep. Typebutloose.co.uk. How's that? Typebutloose.co.uk. If you're on YouTube, it's uh, right at the bottom there, you can see it. Okay? Uh, it gets it numbered. By the way, it comes with 
this amazing picture. I love this picture. If you're on YouTube, you see it. If you're not, look, get closer to your pod device. Look hard. Maybe you see it. Um, that's Jimmy Page handing his guitar off in uh, Frankfurt, Germany on June 30, 1980. Um, and it's an excellent, and I'm telling you, that one's getting framed and put up in my office. But only I have wall space in my office for another Jimmy Page picture. We'd really be laughing. Not the office, sorry, not my office. The Dungeon Studio. It's going up in the Dungeon Studio, which doubles as an office on uh, off recording days. So I'm going to talk about that next week. Uh, we didn't get there. I don't have time to do it justice today. But go buy it if you're if you're if you're looking for a gift for the Led Zeppelin fan. Go get a subscription. Go buy this one plus a subscription for next year. They'll dig on that. They really will. It's exceptional. Uh, I'll write a review in the next couple of days, and uh, um, you can also um, um, read that. But but I I will next week I will get at it. I, I promise. Um, and uh, and so that is it. That, that's it, folks. Ramble on Radio, episode seventy eight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Check rambleonradio.com for notes on this week's podcast. Led Zeppelin news reviews linked tbl mag <laughs> and any links mentioned in today's podcast follow ramble on radio on facebook on google plus and at ramble on blog on twitter talk to me folks tell me who your favorite led zeppelin tribute band is by the way uh, you can subscribe to ramble on radio through itunes and if you do leave a review uh, you can listen on spreaker and be sure to follow ramble on radio on spreaker and check it out at ramble on radio on youtube Thanks for listening to Ramble Out Radio, episode 78. Keep it cooling, babies. <laughs>